Hello and welcome to this space. Thank you for joining us to reflect on the life and legacy of one of the most significant figures in the history of Cornell University and the city of Ithaca, Dr. James Edward Turner. I am Ken Clark, Director of the Tompkins County Office of Human Rights. Today's program is a Black History Month collaboration between the Human Rights Office and the Africana Studies and Research Center at Cornell, of which Dr. Turner was the founding director and served in that role for 22 of his 42 years at Cornell. We are fortunate to have five stellar panelists who will discuss Dr. Turner's life and work, whom I will introduce to you shortly. As an emerging adult, he was inspired by the Pan-Africanism of John Henry Clark, for whom the Africana Center Library is named, and Malcolm X, who befriended him, and his wife Janice, who is a legend in her own right. He created the term Africana Studies. He built an enduring institutional structure at Cornell and supported many community institutions, including the Tompkins County Human Rights Commission, the advisory group to this office, which he once chaired. He was the scholar who influenced generations of students and activists committed to equity, and as and the activists, I should say, committed to equity and justice at Cornell in Ithaca and throughout the African diaspora. He was the man who organized summer institutes focused on the work of Black women scholars, Africana studies, and critical theory. The Association for the Study of African American Life and History called him a foundational leader in the making of Africana studies. He consulted with numerous institutions regarding the development of their Africana academic programs. He held leadership roles in the National Council on Black Studies and the African Heritage Studies Association. He organized and spoke at international conferences and traveled widely throughout the African diaspora or the Black world of Africa, the Caribbean, and North America. And he was a husband, father, grandfather, uncle, a valued friend, and mentor to too many to mention. To begin to discuss Dr. Turner's vast legacy, just simply to begin, requires at least five people. So I recruited five people to reflect on the impact of the living legend who remains with us in spirit. Professor Scott Brown of UCLA's African American Studies Department is one of Dr. Turner's former students. He is also the author of Discourse on Africana Studies, James Turner and Paradigms of Knowledge. He will discuss Dr. Turner's years in Harlem and the community roots of Africana Studies. Professor Carol Boyce Davies of Cornell's Africana Studies Department will talk about Dr. Turner and the development of the field of Africana Studies. Dr. Leslie Lynn McBean Claiborne, Director of GIAC, the Greater Ithaca Activity Center, will focus on Dr. Turner's involvement and impact in the local community, his work with the Ithaca City School District, Community Leaders of Color, or CLOC, GIAC, and other organizations. Kofi Cree, librarian of the John Henry Clark Africana Library at Cornell, will focus on his relationship with Dr. Turner as a student, and most importantly, his impact on the Clark Africana Library. Finally, Cornell Africana Studies Professor Indri Asi Lumumba will speak on Professor Turner, who she calls Big Brother, as an inspiring colleague and principal leader. After her remarks, we will take your questions from, um, from your various vantage points. Professor uh, <clears throat> Brown, lead us off. Sure. First, let me just say thank you very, so very much for putting such an important uh, event together. Uh, I can't uh, say enough about how important Dr. Turner is, uh, both in terms of my own development, but more importantly, uh, to this discipline that we that he helped to establish, uh, known as Africana Studies. 
I'm going to move right into this because I just want to keep my comments brief, but to say that typically we think of Africana studies and uh, Black studies as a part and parcel of the intervention with the university. And I, I want to shift the focus to uh, Dr. Turner's uh, political education in Harlem. I uh, grew up in New York, and I want to talk about that to get us thinking more broadly about what this, uh, at what Africana studies um, in its functional sense can mean in a, in a much more broader context outside of simply university uh, uh, units of organization. Uh, in Harlem, where Dr. Turner really started to encounter a lot of the pillars of what he would come to help to build, Harlem was a Black public sphere that I argue had a lot of the components of what we think of as Black studies at the university. Particularly, it's uh, very, very uh, well-known and influential bookstores, uh, Louis Michaud's uh, National Memorial Bookstore. Um, the bookstore that Dr. Turner uh, really encountered a lot of the literatures of by Herb Apthecker, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, and so many other books, uh, was a bookstore run by a Garveyite, a former member of the UNIA, Richard B. Moore. And he ran the Frederick Douglass bookstore. And as Dr. Turner, uh, then James Turner, um, started to kind of find his way, he found himself having a pool of mentors. Uh, that also, I think, is something that's part and parcel of what we try to do. That is intergenerationality, intergenerational knowledge. Uh, so Richard B. Moore, uh, John Henry Clark, uh, one of our most important leaders in history, uh, Minister Malcolm X, all of those folks are in the mix. L uh, Lorraine Hansberry, all of those people are in the mix, gathering and sharing knowledge. And he's sort of taken in by a lot of the elders as someone with a lot of intellectual ability and promise. But that nurturing came from constant exposure in a Black public sphere. So I think, you know, the implications of this from my perspective has led me to, because as we look at the phenomenal institution that Dr. Turner built at Cornell and so many other young activists who became scholars and institution builders, we often think about the present and we think about the present and we often say to ourselves, wow, time can move on, but progress doesn't necessarily move forward. But I think that would only prevail if we think of the university as the sole incubator of this place called Africana Studies. If we understand its community roots and its roots in living spaces with multiple institutions, you know, sometimes when I think about what Dr. Turner did in Ithaca, I say he just brought Harlem to Ithaca and he didn't just bring it to Ithaca, he brought it to the campus. So you got Ujama Residential College. You have the Africana Studies and Research Center. You have COSEP, which was a big part of recruiting students uh, from diverse class and racial backgrounds. You had the Southside Community Center that we did a lot of programming with. So all of these institutions interacted with one another and, and still interact with one another to this day. At least, in, in, and, and we always think of the, the period that we were at uh, Africana as the golden age. I know, uh, uh, Kofi is going to have a whole different, but I was there in the 90s when we had a kind of Afrocentric resurgent interest in Africa. We would have at the Africana Center Independence Day parties. Remember those, Kofi? Nigerian Independence Day, we'd be in the Hoyt Fuller room. But all of those things of social and gathering, sharing of knowledge, professors with their doors open while people are congregating, but then able to, without being structured by a, the formal dictates of a class, sharing knowledge. And in that regard, I think Dr. Turner's story really underscores, if you think of it differently, the public sphere and community roots 
of Africana studies that would inform the social movement that he participated in as a graduate student called the Black Studies Movement. And that movement so empowered students in the sense that they had this meeting in 1967, 68 called Toward a Black University at Howard University. The students who were agitating for change listened to a graduate student, uh, um, uh, a graduate student who's finishing up, James Turner, talk about this Africana studies ideal. And they were so empowered that he ended up being the person invited to start and lead the Africana Studies Center. So I share these thoughts because I think Dr. Turner's story has implications for where we can go further, where we can go today. And, and that will require us to think in ways that expand beyond the narrow parameters intellectually and spatially that come out of this institution known as the uh, uh, Academy. So I, I hope that we can take that part of the story. So when Dr. Turner, uh, James Turner uh, uh, and Jan Dr. Uh, Janice Turner came to Ithaca, they brought with them the memories, the knowledge that came from organic sources. And if this thing called Africana Studies is gonna prevail in the future, it will be because we are connected to its organic sources and the footsteps of people like Dr. James Turner. Okay, um, I guess it's my turn. I am really pleased, um, Dr. Clark, that, that you've put together this. I still um, run into people up to last week who told me they did not realize the turn of path. So I think it's a really important thing that we mark um, this major transition of such a giant figure and um, um, in this way, particularly the connections with the community that you uh, wanted to do today, and I thank you for doing this. I'm fortunate, um, Scott Brown, that, well, first of all, great shirt. <laughs> I love that shirt. I'm fortunate that, that this semester I'm teaching a graduate course for Black Literary and Cultural Theory. And I deliberately started with your book, um, this book here, right? Uh, and the idea was, I, I felt um, after losing Turner, it would be a tragedy if we have more and more grad students who come through without really having a good knowledge of what, why they are in this space, what they're doing here and so on. And that's really a real possibility as you get more and more students just trying to get a PhD and not really paying attention to what um, brought them to this place. So my students in this class are not predominantly from Africana's PhD class, ironically. Many of them are from other parts of the university, but they are interested and they want to know. So we started talking about um, Africana critical theory as, a, as an area of study. And we looked at Abdul al Kalimat's work, The Future of Black Studies, your work and a new book by Rebecca, Rebecca on Africana critical theory. So I wanna share then with the audience some key points. So from the outset, it is important to see that Africana, the second unit of its kind in the country in its initial formation, had a clearly conceptualized, articulated, and well-documented vision for providing knowledge acquisition, research support, instruction, community engagement, and leadership in the field. Where am I getting this? From a piece that is included in Scott Brown's book titled Africana Studies, and epistemology, a discourse in the sociology of knowledge by James Turner, which also served as the foreword to another collection of essays, which is, was a conference titled The Next Decade Theoretical and Research Issues in African Studies, 1984. So both of these, are, it's the same piece, but one has the context of that conference and the other one is in the midst of several other pieces by Turner. Uh, provide relevant information on the definition of the concept of Africana and its key orientation to address, quote, the global Black experience, unquote. 
to the conceptualizing of Africana studies, which guided its mission and vision as its origins is described as follows. Quote, the concept of ASRC is that of an international center for black studies with a strong emphasis on research, broadly conceived and effective and innovative teaching in terms of structure, use, method, and content. It also identified its geographical reach. And for me, this is even most, the most important thing. The black quote, the black world is perceived as patterns within a trilateral relationship between Africa, the African Caribbean, and the African Americas, plural, with understandably primary concentration on African America. And this is again, African studies and epistemology. So within this vision, the importance of teaching, cultivating a new generation of scholars with the, and the development of transnational connections and the emphasis on community remains central. So that trilateral movement. And for me, until we get to that point where we actually can see that Africana is really able to, to represent those geographies, we have not really completed the vision. So institutional issues in defining Black studies, first of all, have to do with the naming and definition. And although Black studies was the more popular designation for the entire field, students' definition of Africana studies was a more formal institutional version of this area. So Black, he actually says it, that Black studies is the more common usage, Africana studies, the, the institutionalized form of it that one has now in the intellectual world, which are many other departments around the country using that name. But he never relinquishes the intent of Black Studies and was instrumental in the foundation of the National Association of Black Studies, National Council of Black Studies. Uh, and then, of course, we know that there are several variations of the intent and meaning of this concept of Black Studies and several critiques as well, right, from Walter Rodney, the whole question of how we get to these institutions definitely by other people's struggle and then what do we do when we are here and so on. And of course, for him, the institutional context he refers to include books, references, theoretical assumptions, and the entire ideological underpinnings that we do, right? And then uh, Fred Moten's Black Study, which is really interesting because it's older in Fred Moten's eyes than just the institutionalizing of Black Studies in uh, the academy, particularly the historically white academy, which this was a mark of, but instead refers to enti the entire spectrum of engagement with studies of Black people way before that. And then more recently, Robin Kelly um, refers to Black studies as what he calls an epistemological break. So I want to focus on that epistemological break because that's precisely where Tuna falls, right? And this, as I said, is in this course in Africana studies. So what is that epistemological break? The break then is with the, the whole desire then to Eurocentrize knowledge, to see that everything historical happened or was created by or done by European people, which in a way, this is how the universities are constructed, still are constructed with Africana studies always being that contestatory place, which uh, tries to um, constantly push back against that formation and create its own version. So Tune in his essay demonstrate then a deliberateness in harnessing, as Scott Brown said, the generations of scholarship that black scholars have produced before him. People uh, from Du Bois to Cottage, Woodson Schomburg, Hubert Harrison, J. Rogers. And in that essay, interestingly, he talks about three movements, right? The first movement, of course, taking place during the Harlem Renaissance, that so-called Gabby period, um, which Hubert Harrison had defined as the new Negro movement. Uh, and then in that period, and right after that is somebody really, really important. I have to say this is a Howard graduate. And this is William Leo Hansberry, who was the uncle of Lorraine Hansberry. And Hansberry taught at Howard in the 1930s. And guess who was one of his students? John Henry Clark. According to some people, Ayele, for example, argues that that term Africana studies was one that Hansberry also had used in teaching African studies to his students, including John Henry Clark, and you can see how it would come towards Turner, but Turner has to be credited with defining the field with that language. So Hansberry is interesting because in teaching at Howard, he would actually teach at ZKWA and, and many of the people who would go back to Africa and become heads of state. And they were so respectful of him that eventually they would invite him back there and so on. 
So basically, in other words, we are seeing um, the institutionalizing of Africana studies in a school like Cornell, um, but it's coming with all of that long history behind it, the history of Black people studying themselves, uh, what Horton Spillers calls epistemic formations that took place before you have the institutionalizing of Black studies that um, Scott Brown refers to in terms of Harlem being that sort of incubator. I think another way of thinking of it, Scott, is an incubator for all of that, right? And then it launches out. So for in that essay, I'm going to end with a few things that Turner says. He says in this course in Africana studies um, that in terms of that epistemological piece, that Africana studies was created to one, defend against racism and intellectual chauvinism, the fundamental right of Africana studies at all levels of American education for all people, but more specifically for African-American people. And this is really critical to understand this given the pushback that one has now um, against the teaching of African-American studies at the AP level by certain governors who will remain nameless. But that whole question of defending against racism and intellectual chauvinism, the fundamental right at all levels of American education of African studies to be taught uh, is really significant. And his number two, to disseminate, teach, and publish Black studies, social theory, and analysis, criticism, and historiography as a reference the work of pioneering Black scholars. So back again to the Hendrick Clark, the Du Boises, the College of Woodson, all of those people who did that earlier work to make sure that one has that knowledge and bring them back into this pool of uh, ongoing discussion, right? So that would be the second point he raises. Three, to generate new knowledge, research, and codify existing information and predicate contemporary study upon the truths formulated by our mentors. So that's the number three, to create new knowledge and move it further using that past knowledge and bring it in, into the present. And four, and this is where um, my colleague um, Kofi Akri comes in, the director of the John Henry Clark um, Library, four, to preserve the acknowledged value of race and classical texts in the field, archival and library collections, and maintain the scholarly tradition and rich heritage of African people and their descendants. So those are the four points that Turner indicates as framing the discourse on Africana studies. So for Turner then, the Africana studies logic is derived from the philosophy of the African continuum, as he uses that language, which posits fundamental interconnections in the global black, black experience. Consequently, curriculum is predicated upon a model of black studies that begins with the African background and next the transformation into the African diaspora. The Black will is perceived, as we said earlier, as patterns within a trilateral relationship between Africa, the African Caribbean, and the African Americas, with a primary concentration on African America. Essentially, we have not yet achieved Turner's vision in representing all those areas of the Black will above. We still have a lot of work to do, and I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Professor Davies. Dr. McBean Claiborne. Uh, thank you so very much. My gosh, I am getting uh, a lesson and I'm loving every minute of it. Thank you, Dr. Clark, for inviting me to participate um, in this event. Um, interesting enough, uh, uh, you know, Scott, you talked about, you know, sharing knowledge, that intergenerational knowledge that's not gained from the formal dictates of a classroom. And that's what Dr. Turner. Uh, did for us in this community. And I wanna speak just from the community end of things. Dr. Clark, you started off you know, talking about his involvement with the Human Rights, the Office of, uh, of the Human Rights Commission. Um, there was just so much that you know, he did. I remember when I came to this community in 1990 and I, I met Dr. Turner, I believe a couple of years later, um, once I, I told him, you know, where I came from, he then started to grill me about Walter Rodney and Ivan von Sertima. <laughs> He's like, have you read the books? Uh, no. And he said, all right, you go read those books and then come back and let's have a conversation. He was just so encouraging. And the humblest person I have met who had such scholarship and such a pedigree who would come into the community and make sure 
that those of us who were part of this community he made Ithaca his home, but he didn't just stay up on the campus. He came into community and spread that knowledge and encouraged. One of the things I want to share today is, um, you know, Professor Boyce Davies just touched on some of what's happening in our classrooms and the political systems that are trying to erase, you know, African American history and studies and scholarly works from inner schools. And in 1993, I remember. Dr. Turner and his good friend, Don Barr and Professor Don Barr teaming up. I went back and dug amongst my, my books as I knew I had it somewhere to present and to work with the Ithaca City School District and their topic over a number of months in the fall of 1993 was transforming racism in education. Today, some of the very things that they talked about then, that Dr. Turner um, talked about then, are the very things that we are doing battle against now. He, he and uh, Don Barr didn't just say, hey, this is what you do. They also, for all of us, all the teachers, the principals, um, vice principals, everyone participating, put together reading lists and excerpts of many articles by, you know, Peggy McIntosh or Bell Hooks. I remember very well reading so much of Benjamin Ringer's um, We the People and Others. And that's because of what Dr. Turner brought into the community and say, don't just believe what we're saying, read these things and get your knowledge and your tools and how you make that sort of transformation. Here at GIAC, Dr. Turner was on our GIAC board and that's what I mean by his humility. Well over 10 years, he served on the GIAC board of directors. And often I would sit in meetings and just wanna crawl into his head and wonder what is he thinking? But you didn't have to wait very long because he will let you know. And as soon as he opens his mouth, the direction he was such a thought leader that you'd sit there and say, why didn't I think about that? And it would be exactly what's needed to impact people in a different way. We appreciated his service here on the board and it's, it's thoroughly missed. Lastly, I wanna talk a little bit more about, again, just the humility of him and his connection to community. You all know, lots of people come to Cornell University, lots of speakers, activists. Dr. Turner was engaged in bringing a number of those people to Cornell campus. But he didn't just let them stay on campus. He insisted that part of their journey to Ithaca must be to come into community and meet the people in the community and particularly the black community. So I can speak firsthand of being in awe when he brought Angela Davis to GIAC. Cynthia McKinney, who was running for Congress, right here, we all showed up and had dinner with her and engaged in a political discourse on what is the Black agenda that we want our politicians to forward because they said they didn't know or activist Danny Glover said, yes, you're big, you're a star, you're all of this, but come down. And I remember Danny sitting on the stage here at GIAC with Dr. Turner, surrounded by little children. And one little girl, uh, you know, Mr. Glover said, do you have any questions? And she walked up to him and she said, yeah, I do. Do you like my boots? And I remember Dr. Turner saying to her, yes, you should take pride in who you are. So one little girl. And Annie Glover sitting there and saying, I am so thankful for being here to be able to break bread with my people. That is the legacy of Dr. Turner for me. Just making sure that 
whoever came into our community that the downtown community also shared in their knowledge, in their presence and connecting. Lastly, and probably one of the most powerful interactions for me and so many of us in the community, including the late um, Jackie Melton Scott, was Toni Morrison. And I remember Dr. Turner bringing Toni, uh, this author into the community, making sure that she went to the historic St. James AME Zion Church. And that was the gathering place for many of us to meet with her and engage. And he would just sit back, not like, oh, I did this. That was not him. It was about making sure that community get that opportunity as well. So I just wanted to share that a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kofi? Yes, I should take my mute off before I speak, right? <laughs> I wanna um, follow suit, uh, Dr. Clark, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm humbled and um, I want to, I have a mixed thing in terms of remarks I wrote down and just free willing. You know, um, I'm one of the heads, I'm, you know, my relationship with Dr. Turner goes back over 35 years, you know, when I was a grad student at, at Africana Studies and Research Center. And it really is amazing some of the things that Leslin talks about. You know, Scott and I, we had conversations in the past when people kind of look at us and say, why y'all doing stuff in the community? And what they didn't understand, Scott and I talked about, this is what we were trained to do. I mean, Dr. Turner and others at Africana, you know, for example, if there was an event at Africana, make sure there were tickets given to the people in the community and make sure we go down into the community and interact. So it was no accident. My first board I ever served on was Southside, you know? And this was the encouragement and development from Dr. Turner. He saw more in me than I actually saw in myself. You know, uh, when I gave up on Cornell for various different reasons, he didn't forget about me. You know, and he saw something in me that I didn't see. And at that point, I was a librarian at the University of Buffalo, pretty happy. I was teaching in the library school in addition, but. Um, we have, a, we have a thing in our, in our community. When the elders talk to you, listen, you know, and you have a lot of love and respect for the elders and Dr. Turner was just that, you know? And um, so I applied for the position as director of the John Henry Clark Africana Library. And I'm so happy I did. It was the best career move I ever made because what a lot of people really don't understand he was not only a faculty member, father, brother, my God, a husband. I mean, so many different athletes. He was also an institutional builder. He built an institution. Let's be clear about that. Um, he was basically on that cutting edge of creating something for Black folk. And unfortunately, a lot of people saw that in a negative way. But he understood a lot of the people that Scott laid out that preceded Dr. Turner, he followed, you know, in terms of, of building an institution for us because he understood the ills of society and how we were treated. So I, I wanna like kind of go into really briefly four key things that, and I'll be reading some remarks that have been already written. Um, Dr. Turner was clearly, clearly aware of four things among so many different things, terminology, publishing, libraries, and social justice. Those are key things in terms of my relationship, in terms of uh, being a librarian, but also just, you know, um, an individual who grew up in a society. So if we look at that book that was referred to earlier by Dr. Boyce Davies, uh, The Next Decade, Theoretical Research uh, Issues in Africana Studies, and that book was published at the 10-year mark of the establishment of Africana Studies and Research Center. We had a host of scholars, Lerone Bennett, among others, Dr. Clark came up and talked. 
And I can't imagine, it was like a who's who, you know, in terms of black scholarships and thinking and, and intellectual scholarship. And one of the things the namesake of Africana Library, John Henry Clark said, with regard to terminology, he said, I prefer the phrase Africana studies to black studies. And I can remember going to lectures in Harlem um, and hearing this man talk. And one of the things he always imposed on us is like, he says in this quote that I'm, I'm reading, he says, black is an honorable word. And he's glad to see people use it without fear, but it had his little limitations. Black or blackness tells you how you look without telling you who you are. Where has Africa and Africana relate you to land, history, and culture? Let me say that again. Africana relates you to land, history, and culture. And that has significant meanings for our people. And Dr. Clark goes on and says, quoting the Caribbean scholar that Scott mentioned earlier, Richard B. Moore, slaves and dogs are named by their masters free men named themselves. By us embracing that terminology, Africana, it meant something. I can remember, um, this is a sidebar, um, Dr. Turner came into the Africana Library and I had just finished reading Arthur Schoenberg's essay, The Negro Digs Up His Past. For those who don't know, Arthur Schoenberg was a Puerto Rican, was an African Puerto Rican German descent who the, uh, the famous Schomburg Center for Black Studies Research Public Library is named after. And in this essay that was published in 1924, Arthur Schomburg used the words Africana, but I think Powerboss Davies is correct when she says Dr. Turner just took it to a new level. And I can remember having a conversation with Dr. Turner, like I just saw this term that Arthur Schomburg, as if he didn't see the article himself. But being the mentor that he was, he just let me embrace and let me have the joy in, in sharing this with him. And that's the kind of person he was just an, an amazing individual I loved. Uh, publishing. A lot of people don't realize that back in Turner's day, the Africana Studies and Research Center had its own monographic series. Let me say that again. The Africana, Africana Center published books, okay? And in one of the books that was published in 1978 by Hollis, Hollis Lynch, Dr. Turner writes, the Africana Studies and Research Center monograph series is intended to offer a reputable medium for publishing selected original manuscripts that represent research on important subjects. It is our express intention to provide an opportunity for black scholars to publish serious theoretical and empirical analysis of questions that make a valuable contribution, culture, and political development of African people. When he says African people, he's also talked about black people around the world, not only in Africa, in South America, Central America, North America, and Asia. You know, so this is important for those that understand that. This is what institution building is a partly about. He recognized that there were people who looked like him that didn't have, always have the opportunity to publish. So what did we do? We gonna publish you. And they were published. With regard to libraries, um, he was he curated the Africana Library. Okay, when the Africana Center was founded in 1969, and Scott was right, I think it was, or Professor Boyce Davies, this came out of the Black Power Movement or the Black Studies Movement, where Black students wanted to um, have a place where they can study who they were as a people. And Dr. Turner understand, understood one of the key things in having that was also developing a library to put books, collection building in there that reflected who we were as a people. Dr. Turner wrote in an essay, um, library in the, li in the life of black people. He says, the library is an indefensible factor in the equation of determining the pride, prestige, and success of most colleges and universities. He understood that the building of a specialized distinct collection concentrating on the history, culture, and life condition of people of African descent would aid in expanding teaching beyond the Eurocentric model. Let me say this. The Eurocentric model viewed the world from a Western perspective and those of African descent were seen as never contributing to world civilization. And this was part of the occupation to illustrate 
uh, hall at Cornell in April 8, 19, 1969, where Black folks folks racism, and they felt like this institution didn't support who they were. And so anyway, the building of this library was really key in terms of carrying on the legacy. So in talking about building a special distinct Africana Center collection, Turner was challenging the longstanding misconceptions of Black inferiority and building to the table of demands that Blacks made during the civil rights and Black student movements. Those pleads by those students and activists included being treated with dignity and respect. And that was one of the hallmarks of Martin Luther King's civil rights movement. So this is again, a continuation, okay? Um, Turner understood that the field of Black studies and its Africana-centered library stood for more than collection of resources. A big part of the library's mission was to give voice or empowerment to those of African descent and allow them to carry a collection that was significant to them. And finally, in the book, Discourse on Africana Studies, Ron Daniels wrote, a central focus of Black studies was to address the miseducation of students of African descent by providing a critical understanding of their history, culture, and African-centered framework for examining the world and knowledge and tools to become agents of change for this oppressed people. And lastly, what I want to do is talk about social justice, because we have all this stuff about social justice. We've always been dealing with this. You know, like I tell people, I could turn you on to an essay published by Frederick Douglass in 1856 or so, and you would swear he was talking about something today, you know. And so this issue, what we're dealing with, this is a, this is an age old problem. But Dr. Turner understood using the medium of education of the university to address those ills. African American journalist Carl Rowan, he actually expanded on the, what I just read about Daniels. When he captured the road, he says, the library is the temple of learning and learning has liberated more people than all the wars in human history. A black person who wants to be liberated first needs to get learning. If he does it, it will make him, and we could change those pronouns with her as well, a formidable force against would-be oppressor. So finally, what I wanna say is, Dr. Turner was following a legacy of Black intellectuals like Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And as noted in the book, The Next Decade, Woodson, he observed that the whole system of education in America conspired to teach Black people to despise themselves. We all know that famous line in the book where he says, if Blacks were so conditioned to go through a back door, and if there was no back door, they would make one and go through it. I mean, this is kind of the brainwashing that, that we had to overcome. And Woodson was referring to a characteristic of white domination education system that, that basically excluded the, the consideration of Blacks in the history, culture, and economic life in American history. So, and this book was published in 1984. So a lot of the ideals I'm talking about, they were, Dr. Turner did so much in nurturing us and, and, and getting us to really understand the plight. So when we talk about what's going on today, I think Dr. Boyce Davies referred to it, where we have people that are trying to eradicate Black studies. They're going to talk about this critical race theory, not really understanding what it truly is. These are fights we've always been going on. And Dr. Turner was in the forefront of these fights. And thankfully, you have five people in front of you, six people in front of you, including Dr. Clark, who understands what he meant and we are here to continue his legacy. And we are on the preference of, of passing his legacy on to others. That's kind of my role. And I'll stop right here. Thank you so much for allowing me to express some thoughts. Well, thank you very much, Kofi, for your commentary, as well as all of uh, the panelists. And now we will hear from Dr. Asim Lumumba, and then we will move forward into, into the Q&A period of our program. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Reverend Clark and brothers and sisters. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's unfortunate that, that uh, Professor Turner is not here to hear us talk about him. <laughs> uh, but that's the role that we who are still here must uh, play. Um, I, I, Professor Turner, uh, my big brother 
was the most principled person and humble, as it has been already said. I have seen him in different contexts and his words, his message does not change to adjust to the audience. He's very principled. That, that's something that really marked me. Uh, briefly, as I mentioned, um, when we were sending him off, uh, I met him the first time while I was a graduate student, PhD student at the University of Chicago with uh, my boyfriend, who is now has been my husband now for 40 years. We went to an event. We were very blessed in that period, starting at the University of Chicago. Um, Kwame Ture came, and then uh, Professor uh, Turner came. So this is when we, we met him the first time. And we were so impressed with the clarity of his uh, argument, the sharpness of his argument. And I had no idea that one day I would be uh, blessed to have him as a colleague. Fast forward, in 1990, I was um, uh, selected as an African Studies Ford Foundation Fellow. And during the same time, I received an invitation to go to UNESCO in Paris as resident fellow. So I negotiated both and I was allowed to go to Paris. But I came first with my husband to make arrangement for our housing when I, I returned the next year. So it was in May 1990, I remember vividly. That's when we met face to face. My husband had met him again at Vassa College when he was a, um, a reviewer of the Africana Studies at Vassa College. But for me, since Chicago, that was the first time I, I was seeing him. And I remember when we left that day, going back to Poughkeepsie, the way he told us, safe journey, the, his way of saying drive safely, it was the humanity the sincerity that he cared is not just a phrase. We talked about it for a long time. And then eventually in spring uh, 1991, I came to the Africana Studies as a Fulbright and also as a, the Ford Foundation Africana Fellow. I was supposed to stay for a few months, but uh, eventually my course, Women and Gender Issues in Africa, was positively reviewed by the faculty and I was asked to stay for one more year and one more year. And here I am, 32 years later. That's the Akan proverb. It's the good sauce that pulls the seat. You taste it a little from far and then you get closer and closer. So I want to say that I miss Professor Turner. I have to say that on this floor, because all the lesson I had learned from him just by going to say hello and the impromptu discussions, I feel enriched and blessed to have had those opportunities. I want to also mention that I had worked with uh, Dean Turner. Dean Turner and Professor Turner have given, given me unique opportunities to understand certain things. When I was selected uh, uh, to serve on the uh, selection committee of uh, incoming students uh, in the art and sciences many years back, Dean Turner was, we served on the same committee. I learned so much from him. The kind of dedication, what you do, in order to make sure that you give same opportunity to different people. So I have navigated between these uh, two and at the same time, single uh, people literally. Uh, and uh, I want to, to say that. Uh, briefly, I, was, uh, I have an article that I have uh, written that I would like uh, to read a few sections from to, to be um, uh, uh, to acknowledge that. I, I mentioned in this article uh, entitled Africana Studies, an insurgent discipline with a global outlook. It is part of a publication by Cornell University on the global 
uh, the dimension of, uh, of uh, the university. And I was contacted to write a piece on Africana studies. I started to write it while Professor Turner was alive. And uh, sadly, by the time I revised the article, he had, had joined the ancestors. So let me briefly share a few sections with you. Uh, it may be disjointed because of uh, the time. So I say here that uh, there are two intertwined components that are distinctly dynamic and intrinsic part of the Africana studies in Professor Turner's work. The innovation of Africana studies as an academic discipline and the founding of the Africana Studies and Research Center uh, in 1969. So here the point I make is that you can be a great inspiring uh, philosopher, um, idea, a, a person who makes ideas without being involved in how you give full meaning, practical meaning to those ideas. And Professor Turner did both. You can also in, inherit other people's ideas and put them in practice. In his case, he had the ideas and was at the forefront in giving meaning to those ideas, in creating the center at Cornell after conceptualizing the idea of Africana studies. So these are two important dimensions. So I, I want to go quickly uh, because of time to say that the term Africana studies, the Africana, uh, as I indicate in the article, merit reference uh, critical of self-naming, the importance of what uh, um, Kofi just mentioned, self-naming and agency while capturing the vision of a dialectical relations uh, between the African continent and the diaspora. It was chosen to reflect its philosophical and epistemological framework amid the growing demand for a systematic inclusion of African or African related studies. Cornell was identified as the first institution of higher learning to invent the overarching concept, Africana studies, in contrast to all the others that Professor Boyce Davis mentioned, Black studies, urban studies, Afro-American studies, African studies uh, that refer to the continent and so and so forth. The concept included the African continent and the worldwide African diaspora. While the specific word Africana had been used previously as also Kofi mentioned by other global scholars such as Carter, Wood, um, uh, Carter, Cat, Carter uh, Woodson and W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, Jonathan Fenderson in his article in the edited book by um, uh, Dr. Scott Brown, his article is a uh, mentioned introduction, Black Intellectual Insurgency, James Turner and the Discipline of Africana Studies. Well, he, there he mentioned that while the term Africana had been used before, uh, as I mentioned by uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and Carter Woodson, uh, uh, Turner, to quote him, initiated the use of the term as a conceptual intervention in black studies, a concept and plan in 1969. However, uh, he said that the article that Professor Turner wrote, Africana studies and epistemology provide the most insightful exploration of the notion. So one of the most audacious uh, uh, aspect of Africana studies was the conceptualization of an interdisciplinary field that resonates with what the French sociologist Emile Durkheim indicated in the idea that a sum is not a simple addition of its part, as it is more complex. The synthesized essence of interdisciplinary, the interdisciplinarity of Africana studies was unique, intentional, 
and inspired not to emulate the, the uh, duped uh, traditional discipline, which tended to operate in silos and, uh, and uh, you know, fierce competition. So the fundamental uh, global essence of Africana studies was reflected in the curriculum that had an interdisciplinary component pertaining to specific courses, faculty, academic event on the Cornell campus and their intrinsic, intrinsic connection to activism and outreach toward the social transformation community uh, extending from the local to the global stage. So that community is in Ithaca, it is over, uh, over in, uh, across the Atlantic in Africa. As uh, some of his former students mentioned the trips to the different part of the African continent. So I, um, I see time is uh, so short, uh, although really great um, to mention the extraordinary accomplishment of this uh, giant. Um, I would like to here mention one aspect, then I will uh, stop. I had highlight, highlighted several sections I wanted to read, but I think it will not be possible. So let me just mention one aspect. One aspect is the establishment and teaching of African languages at Cornell University. It is, um, I did an interview of Professor Turner in March 19, uh, 2015, when I was a uh, chair of, uh, of a committee here at the African Studies on African languages and international uh, studies of African studies. Um, so when I interviewed him about African languages, this is, these are some of the things that he said. I will just mention a few. The articulation of African languages constituted an integral part of the conceptualization of the vision and mission of the curriculum of the Africana studies. At the inception of Africana studies and the quest for its establishment as a new and legitimate field of study, the teaching of African languages was deemed a fundamental component. At that time, the perception and treatment of African languages in the American academy and society at large reflected the negative narrative associated with the location of Africa and its people in Western and American imagination and in knowledge acquisition and production. Thus, at Cornell University, in the founding of Africana studies, African languages were considered to be of the same value as African history and broader culture in providing a solid education for students, researchers, and various professional needs. The articulated goals of the professional front included scholarly research, teaching, and other professional uh, competencies toward international developments, US foreign policy in terms of the bilateral and multilateral re relation, as well as in the United Nations system. There was a quest in the Africans, Africana Center for training more competent scholars in African languages, in part to dispel stereotypical perception about African languages as they were still assumed to be rudimentary and not deserving to be considered languages, but rather dialect. Instead of considering the multiplicity of African languages as a sign of the capacity of African people to manage diversity in building competencies in various languages that are subgroup of larger language groups and families, they were rather considered as vernaculars and fragment and not autonomous languages. This view of African languages was part of the distortion and outright racist construction in the popular culture 
and the representation of African people, African Americans, Africans in the broader diaspora and African history, culture and language. Academic discourses had an impact on the strategies and approaches in the struggle to establish the, uh, the language of Africana studies curriculum. So I, I have a longer uh, interview of him. Uh, I will not be able to read it all, but all I want to say is today, you can take many, several African languages, Kiswahili, Yoruba, uh, and then they will be of the same level recognition as the required language, the same as the Romance languages, uh, and, and, uh, and languages of European uh, 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 this history. So I would like to uh, stop here because the, <laughs> of my time is up, uh, but I just want to um, acknowledge the one dimension I, I used to travel a lot and wherever I went, when I mentioned Africana studies, the first question, how is uh, Professor Turner, how is James Turner, depending on the age of people who were asking me. So he was, he had an influence that is difficult to really uh, uh, measure, synthesize in a few uh, uh, words. Um, one thing I would like to mention before is this uh, philosophy of Africana studies. Again, it's not just uh, adding uh, African, uh, uh, African American, the, uh, the Americas, the Caribbean. No, it is the creation of an entirely new philosophy and synthesized uh, base, basis of knowledge. So we cannot, as there are some uh, uh, really signed, we cannot dismantle the whole Africana study, say, well, we're taking this part, we're taking it, uh, um, uh, disintegrating it. It's not possible. It's an entity that has its own properties. And so it cannot be dismantled by taking apart the different initial uh, uh, units that constituted this new philosophy and area of study. Uh, so I would like to stop here. Um, I, I hope when the article is published, I will share it. Um, and I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Kofi. You gave me some feedback in one uh, version of that article that I, I wrote. So I thank you all again for giving me this opportunity to hear all you, the sharing and celebrating the life and memory and legacy of a great son of Africa, Professor Turner. And thank you so much, Dr. Asi Lumumba. We're gonna move on now to the uh, question and answer period. I'm gonna start off with a question. Some other questions may appear in the queue, but um, one of the, the uh, questions I have, um, <clears throat> excuse me, is, is this, or rather to ask the uh, panel, can you talk, can anyone of you talk about the role that Dr. Turner um, or how Dr. Turner provided a haven for a number of activists and scholars to make transitions into new vocational directions? In this case, I think of, for example, James Foreman Sr., the legendary activist um, involved with SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and the one who authored the Black Manifesto. Uh, his son is currently on the faculty of Yale Law School. And he was one of those persons that Dr. Turner helped to make a shift and transition in, in his vocational course. Can any of you speak to that? Oh, Scott, you're on mute. I'll, I'll talk about it more broadly that uh, one part of Africana in its operational form that made it um, very unique was that Dr. Turner saw it as a place that expanded the idea of who are the producers of knowledge. So activists, those who are actually involved in organizing, could come, 
teach and be heard and develop their thought in particular. Even some of our most renowned uh, scholars, like uh, Dr. Walter Rodney, for instance, uh, was at Af the Africana Studies and Research Center. Uh, but long before we started thinking about poets in the way that we may now, Dr. Turner would have Haki Manabuti here, Sonia Sanchez here, and so many others. So um, Cynthia McKinney was, was here uh, at Africana for a period of time as well. So there's a space in Africana for not just veterans of the movement that are going through a transition, but also for uh, people that just have something to add. It's, it's I think this opening stems from the idea of a much more broader terrain where knowledge can be produced. So he's not looking for certification from the academy per se. And there are lots of scholars, even John Henry Clark, uh, Dr. Ben Yakinan, so many others that taught at Cornell that may not have had the opportunity, to, the same kind of opportunity to share their knowledge elsewhere. And even what I, what I, what I liked about Dr. Turner in this regard was that it was never sort of a, a network of people that he favored. He was really interested in exposing students, both majors in Africana, residents of Ujamaa, you know, the, the everyday people in uh, Ithaca to a breadth of knowledge. His most important, um, I think, value was this idea that you have to be exposed to the breadth of Black thought. So I think that is evidence in his classes in terms of some of the people that, some of the political prisoners and people that he would bring up, and, and also in just the actions of the center. Who's pushing the envelope and how can we actually become a uh, form of support for them? And also so being, uh, how do we also benefit from what they have to share? I, I just want to add to what Scott is saying because he's right on point. You know, I remember when I was a grad student at Africana, I was uh, teaching a grad assistant for William Branch. If people who don't know who William Branch is, you need to Google him. He was a key playwright that was friends of Lorraine Hansberry, Paul Robeson, all these other great people doing a, doing a, a critical period in our history. And he taught at Africana. Right? Mm -hmm. And um, and I can remember I was there when uh, when when Professor Branch brought up Spike Lee. OK, mm -hmm. for 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 I think it was the kickoff for his film um, School Days. And but but Bill Branch is bigger than life, man. You know, in terms of his contribution to the theoretical plays and and, and so forth and so on, and uh, he was just a regular guy. I mean, that's the cool thing about Africana. You know, as a grad student, it was like amazing the folks that passed through Africana, just as guest lecturer. I can remember hanging out with Hugh Mesakella. I can remember mm. hanging out with Kwari Torre or, or, mm. or Stokely Carmichael, you know, but these are the, so he exposed us and it wasn't like that he brought them up and they were isolated as Leslie talked about before to these people on the Hill. No, he shared it with everybody. And what, what, what a thing we learned that they're just regular folk, just like you, you know? So, I mean, it, it, it's just amazing. So that legacy it, it, it's just amazing in terms of the foresight that he had, you know, I mean, I'll stop there because I, I imagine some other folks may want to comment on your question. I, I would like to add, uh, not specifically uh, mentioning people, but he indicated the framework and institutional space that made those invitation possible was that autonomy. Mm -hmm. uh, if there was no institutional autonomy in terms of the intellectual dimension, but also in this practical world, right. the resources, financial resources. If you don't control the resources with which you can bring the best uh, mind in terms of helping actualize your own plan, then it will not happen. Uh, so this is very important to mention today. When you don't have the uh, some 
the space, the institutional autonomy in terms of resources. As he indicated one day in a conversation, casual conversation, if we wanted to invite America Cabral, we didn't need the per permission from anybody. If we had the financial resources to do it, we did it. Mm -hmm. If we wanted to develop a line, an academic line for us to benefit from the particular insight knowledge of somebody who may not be acknowledged in the other academic unit. Well, if we had the autonomy, we could invite such a people. So this is an important component of building the institutional unit. Building the institutional unit mm -hmm. has the intellectual um, foresight, having the intellectual foresight comes with having the capacity, the yes. material capacity. And that's what made it possible for them to decide we want to invite so-and-so. Um, uh, Kofi, I, I was fortunate enough to have arrived while uh, Professor Branch was still uh, teaching here. So mm. those were really great moments of uh, the capacity uh, to, to, to host the people who can help advance the idea of African studies. Anyone else want to respond to this question? I, I have a couple more before we uh, end. But, um, you know what, some, some of the conversation talked about, you know, this break from the assumptions of European standards of knowledge um, and, and um, and the ways in which Dr. Turner's exposure to persons such as John Henry Clark, Malcolm X, Richard Moore, and his, you know, evolution, that, you know, he was sort of um, experiencing some of the preconditions of that sort of break, that epistemological break, dealing with, you know, how do we know what we know, for example. But in, um, in what Dr. Turner did in terms of his practice as well as his teaching, he seemed to symbolize what uh, Africana scholar James Stewart, who I knew from my Penn State days, he founded the, the African and African-American Studies Department at Penn State in uh, 1980. And he wrote, he wrote this piece about Malcolm and he talked about how Malcolm made accessible information reserved for academic specialists and made it accessible to everyday people. And it seems like Dr. Turner carried on that tradition in that mm -hmm. sense. And maybe one way to kind of spin off of that with a question is whether um, we could, any of you could talk about the personal and intellectual influence of Malcolm on the young Dr. Turner. Oh. I think Scott has done the most research on that. Yes, I want to make sure, though, I'm not uh, taking up too much time, but I want to just say that uh, Malcolm X is a profound influence on Dr. Turner, both in terms of his uh, ideas, but also in terms of just their friendship. Uh, Malcolm X is one of the people early on who recommended that Dr. Turner consider uh, going to graduate school uh, when um, he um, and um, Dr. Uh, uh, Janice Turner went to Michigan, uh, Malcolm's uh, brother Filbert uh, picked them up at the uh, bus station there as they uh, transitioned uh, over uh, to uh, uh, where the school is. So there's a close relationship. I think Malcolm X's Pan-Africanism, his idea that uh, you have to have this, you can't talk about liberation uh, in a very narrow context, that there's a symmetry. Mm -hmm what's happening on the continent and throughout the black world. That's sort of um, something that's an assumed precept in Africana studies, but it wasn't the case when uh, Malcolm speaks before the organization of African unity and starts to think about the movements of people in diasporas in a political context. There's a speech that Malcolm gave when he's talking about people in Ghana. And he, he said a word that I was surprised to hear Malcolm say, he says, they were over there partying and advocating for the liberation of their people. He said, everybody else goes abroad and still 
argues for their people. And so uh, Dr. Turner had that kind of seriousness uh, mm -hmm. with respect to thinking about global issues and, and global Black life. So I think Malcolm X's Pan-Africanism. Also, I think Dr. Turner did not, you know, uh, suffer fools lightly, as we say, meaning that if you were Black and you were wrong, he would tell you. And there was no thing of, okay, let's look at our oppression as one directional because he, he dealt with internalized racism. So, at, but the difference is like Malcolm, Malcolm would make the critique, but he still pointed us to the origins of those ideas at the same time. So we'll say, you know, folks teach this, capitalism teaches this, and we imbibe, but we, we have the responsibility of the change, but there wasn't this blaming of the victim, but there was the acknowledgement of the sources of our oppression while at the same time trying to deal with the way that our own contradictions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. Um, I've got one last question in, um, <clears throat> that, uh, um, on which we'll end the following discussion. Um, Saira Raza asked, can you share your observations, the panel that is, of how Dr. Turner protected his and our intellectual space and created pathways to explore scholarship in this interdisciplinary way. And then I'll, I'll, I'll wait for your answer and then I'll go to the acknowledgement from the chat um, and read that. Uh, can, could you please uh, repeat the question again? Okay. The question is, can you share your observations of how Dr. Turner protected his and our intellectual space and created pathways to explore scholarship in an interdisciplinary way? Hmm. Well, uh, you know, we, we, uh, often we talk about this uh, notion interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, and um, all this uh, concept. So the, the interdisciplinarity is what was done through the Africana studies. You create a new, a new uh, discipline, um, imagining it from, from the very beginning uh, to be autonomous, but at the same time, there is a dimension of uh, multidisciplinarity presence because Africana studies had been created as an academic uh, uh, project in the later 60s, while many of us went through other <laughs> disciplines. Uh, Professor Turner himself uh, was trained as a sociologist. And that's how I also connected with him as a, as a fellow sociologist. His analysis of, of the system uh, is from this uh, uh, sociological uh, perspective. So mm -hmm. he was aware of the necessity to uh, accommodate all those disciplines because we didn't have Africana graduates to come to continue to uh, advance the Africana studies project, but how do you adjust to the necessity of that interdisciplinary perspective? Mm -hmm. uh, I remember Professor um, uh, uh, Cross, Bill Cross, mm -hmm. uh, there was an event uh, in, um, in his name, uh, several years after he left, he used to come for that event, an annual event. And in the last one that I attended, um, as I can remember, he explained that he came to Cornell Africana Studies as a psychologist. He left very different uh, scholar because of these ways of uh, understanding the uh, particular human condition, social condition, but from all these different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, it, it doesn't mean that you just accept anything. The, the interdisciplinary necessity must be acknowledged in order 
for people coming from different disciplinary uh, uh, traditions to be part of that project, to advance it, to understand it. And it's not easy to understand because I, even at this moment, there are still questions being asked, what is African studies? So it's not a simple uh, concept. It, it takes uh, some kind of uh, intellectual effort uh, to, to understand what it, it means and mm -hmm. what it is, it doesn't mean. To define a phenomenon, you define it by what it is, as well as by what it is not. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, yes, uh, these are just a few comments. I don't know if I can answer your question correctly, uh, Ken. Just to piggyback on but what Professor Salamumba said, I'm of the belief that the struggle continues. You see, and um, yes, this, this discipline was established first at um, the first studies program is at San Francisco State College. By the way, Danny Glover was a part of the student group that that led that fight to get it. Uh, I'm of the belief that the struggle continues, and 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 that the things that the rationale behind the, the development of this discipline is still there. You know, that's why you can have a Donald Trump come into office and some of these other people who are portraying those negative ideologies. So the struggle really continues and it's a global struggle. It's just not one within the Americas. Leslin talks about the great country that she comes from, which produced two of my favorite scholars, um, Walter Rodney and Ivan Van Sertema. I learned so much from Ivan Van Sertema. They came before Columbus, as well as his, his series of publications about Blacks in terms of what we contribute in that antiquity, you know? Yeah. And so then you look at Brazil. Brazil has the largest number of Black folks outside of Africa. We never talk about that. So this is a global thing. And, and just to think that because this discipline was established 50 some odd years ago, or whatever, that the job is done, you're way wrong. So this is an ongoing fight. And I work for a university and people within the library, thankfully that support what I do, you know, and I'm gonna continue to do it and I'm gonna continue to get better at it. Because it was people like a Dr. Turner and Jess Lumumba, uh, Carol Boyce Davies, look like we would, you know, um, I could go on Bob Harris, you know, so many, Margaret Washington, there's so many names of <coughs> males and females that impacted me. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but the struggle definitely is, is a struggle. And Frederick Douglass talks about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, nothing is given to us. I'll stop there. Yeah, I wanted to add to that a little bit. Thank you, Kofi. Because uh, Joseph and Dre said, if you go to Africa, different places, people ask you, but you're in the Caribbean, the same thing happens. And he had been on the campus when the Rastafari was there with Walter Rodney and so on. So he talked to me very fondly about that. But I want to stress that in his definition, I read it carefully of the epistemology. He talked about a trilateral relationship with Africans in the Americas plural. So it has a diasporic framework um, already built in. But I want to say that at the time when he was writing, you would not have had as much scholarship in that area. In fact, for a long time, so he was ahead of the curve. A long time, Africans in the Americas were invisible. Now you still see them mostly during football, you know, World Cup or whatever. Um, and every now and then, um, it, there's a glimpse of it as recently Francia Marquez, the vice president of Colombia. So Turner was ahead in adding Africans in the Americas. He uses the plural in that description there, the Caribbean and African Americans. Um, I think um, in terms of Turner, what I saw was uh, in all of my encounters with him, and many of them I had when I was at Prophet Binghamton, um, I would talk to him all the time about whatever we were doing there, particularly activist things. And he was such a gentle soul, but I think he was a bit short-sighted uh, in terms of who um, end up becoming faculty down the road. Um, because 
I think there's a distinction between people who just like, who studied Africa as opposed to people who studied any of those relationships, as opposed to people who really understand that intellectual nexus, the scholar activist, the study and struggle paradigm and so on. So many people are not there. They just maybe did that topic and that's what they do. And that's a lot of the people who end up populating the current Africana studies. So mm -hmm. Tuna, I, I've said this in writing, so I'm not saying anything that nobody has heard, not heard me say. So the current faculty are faculty who, um, and they bring in grad students who behave similarly. They don't have um, that um, sensibility, that understand the relationships that you talk about, Leslie, the community and so on. Some of us still do. So I think his, his gentleness, his kindness, his openness, to people was also taken advantage of. And I, I need to say very early that that one within one year of the, the um, Africana being formed, the building was a uh, subject of arson. So uh, many people in that period talk about the fact that it was not a desired entity on campus and it still is not. And there's all kinds of processes in place to ensure that the leadership that comes in is not a leadership that is going to be as transformative as Ms. Turner. Often, we have to understand that if you're running one of these programs, you're not going to be loved often by the administration. Because when you go to talk to them, you want more stuff, or you're trying to get more things. And the assumption that you're going to be loved by them all the time um, is a faulty one, or that you are that kind of person who want to be loved. I want to be loved. <laughs> It's a problem because in the end, you don't have growth and, and you don't have the kind of movement that Turner envisaged. So I see it much, much broader than the narrow Afrocentric paradigm that was one of the incarnations. I saw his earlier model as being more expansive and really looking at the global intent of the, of the African community. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say about that. And I cannot help but think that that reflects the influence of Malcolm X, who was thinking globally and yeah. saying the African-Americans look at themselves not as a minority in the U.S., but as part of a larger global community back in 19, particularly in his last 11 months of his life. Dr. McBean. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Clark, you pulled the words right out of my mouth. Um, you know, we were talking about Malcolm <clears throat> X and, and what he stood for and sort of that connection with Turner, uh, with mm -hmm. Dr. Turner. Um, and I think of, um, and I, I remember reading it in, in the book that uh, you did, Scott, just about learning from Turner that if you are really going to be protecting this entity, as uh, Dr. Asai Lumumba stated, of Africana uh, studies and the whole diaspora, that global worldwide connection, we have to be, you know, not only of the race, but about the race and for the race. Now that is just so important. And if you are not there and you're just a scholar who has studied this, uh, you know, African studies or whatever it is, you don't have that connection and you cannot protect that entity. That needs to happen. You can have all the scholars you want to have, but if that personal, soul connection is not there, it's hard to. I stood on the legislature floor. Um, you know, uh, Professor Boyce Davies just talked about what felt like the dismantling of that entity, hmm. trying to get rid of one unit and one piece at a time, you know, and in our own political arena, try to bring legislation to ask the university to allow Africana to continue to stand mm -hmm. as that unit that had the means, the wherewithal, the resources to bring the scholars, to educate, to help people embrace the entire worldwide concept, to help us as Black people understand our own selves. That was huge. And yet we see some of that dismantling happening. Mm. So I don't know if it answers sort of the question that the, the last person was asking, but there has to be lots of 
work done to preserve what Dr. Turner built, the vision that he and others had about what we can do. And I think it was Scott just talking about you know, we, we're, we're going to teach about, you know, colonialism and colonization and capitalism, but not just of, as victims of it, but how do we teach about how we transform those very things into benefits for us as a people, because we have what it takes mm-hmm. to make that happen. I think it's so important and not to get off topic, but it's so important for us to understand where do we came from and why we're here. When I was an undergraduate at Montclair State College in New Jersey, uh, Rosa Parks came to visit, right? And she gave a speech about comparing the civil rights movement with the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. Uh, What I remember that day, I was the first one to raise my hand, right, after she finished speaking. And I simply said, thank you. Because I understood if it wasn't for folks like her, I would not be standing at Montclair State. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think the same could be true, said true with Dr. Turner and other ones. They laid this foundation and it's up for us to continue to build on it. Um, Because... We, our history, and and I'm not excluding whites, because Leslin earlier mentioned Don Barr. Don Barr was a white scholar who was like, wow, you had to meet Don. Don was just amazing. He was the first white person. I have white folks in my family, my stepfather, stepsisters, and so forth and so on. His, I, his ideology was so advanced. He, one of the things he shared with me, white people need to talk to other white people about racism. So what am I saying? Dr. Turner also found allies outside of the black community. And I think that's important because I think he's misunderstood in that mm-hmm. light. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, so, um, yeah, we, we, we still got work to do. And I, I know we, it's going to continue, you know, and we go through ups and downs. And, but I'm, I'm in it for the long run. Thank you all so much. I want to say, too, as we begin to close, uh, Dr. Turner's nephew, Sundiata Pri, was uh, in the audience and um, thanked all of you for sharing and spreading his legacy. And um, this has been a great discussion. And um, I think there might be, there there may be some need to carry this further (laughs) um, in terms of of, of further discussion and even a different kind of platform to to really address the vast legacy of uh, Dr. James Turner. But thank you all so much. And for what audience we may have left, we thank you all for having come to join us and to uh, participate in tonight's event. And and we look forward to seeing you the next time when we um, bring um, our next set of programs, which will focus on Women's History Month. And um, in the role of in the next steps in the um, stages or in the struggle for reproductive rights. So again, thank all of you for, uh, in particularly for my wonderful panelists, uh, the group of five that we needed to have at the begin the discussion about Dr. Turner's legacy. So thank you all so very much. Thank you all, and have a good evening. We, uh, we won't us on the panel will not sign off, but we'll sign off for the rest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much.